Hello and happy day. How does slowing down sound to you today? Would you like to reduce the noise for just a bit? Are you ready to make a choice and decide to listen? My name is Igor SF Walker and I'm here to remind people to slow down, to reduce the noise, to walk their lives into a natural flow. Welcome back to the Book of the Week series. Every week as I read another amazing title, I share it with the world and today we look at radical honesty. How to Transform Your Life by Telling the Truth by Brad Blanton, Ph.D. We all lie like hell. It wears us out. It is the major source of all human stress. Lying kills people. The kind of lying that is most deadly is withholding or keeping back information from someone we think would be affected by it. Psychological illness of the severest kind is the result of this kind of lying. Psychological healing is possible only with the freedom that comes from not hiding anymore. Keeping secrets and hiding from other people is a trap. Stress is not a characteristic of a life or of times, but of people. Stress does not come from the environment. It comes from the mind of the individual under stress. We make certain assumptions about the world and we become attached to those assumptions. We suffer from thinking. People who live according to the principles like, I hated you then and for a good reason, so I still hate you now, cannot get over things. This is reasonable but stupid. I've seen a lot of reasonable stupid people in my life. Life goes on and the truth changes. This just happens the way life is. What was once true is often no longer true just a little while later. Yesterday's truth is today's bullshit. Even yesterday's liberating insight is today's jail of stale explanation. Abstraction from past experiences, being mistaken for current experience itself is the major disorienting error of the normal garden variety neurotic. Evidence from the past does not prove anything about current experience. We, neurotics, are people who make big generalizations to cover long periods of time. We say things like, you always and you never. We attribute all of our power to circumstances and say things like, it makes me... When we say these things, we usually have no idea. We are living in an imaginary world of our own creation. What kills us is intense attachment to our interpretations and failure to distinguish these interpretations from sensate reality. These process of learning to categorize experiences and then forgetting the distinction between categories and experience itself is what is called learning how to lie. Learning how to pretend, interpret, evaluate and imagine is a natural process for every human being. It is fun. Most of the learning that occurs in early childhood, preschool and then in elementary school is an elaboration of these abilities in every culture of the world. As infants grow towards adulthood, this learning of pretense is going on. The long process of learning how to lie culminates in adolescence. Adolescents get lost in their imaginings about who they are. If we, humans, are to be saved from ourselves individually as well as collectively, we have to learn more about the art and science of speaking the truth. None of us can do this without a lot of help from each other. We grow up all the rest of the way surrounded and protected by this expanded sea of suggestions and eventually thousands of refinements later. A group of suggestions becomes who we think we are. Who we actually are, of course, remains always more than the mental images we form while growing up. First, we are the experiencer of what is momentarily present. Second, we are the multi-sensory recorder of the experience. 
Last, and less importantly, we are the rememberer. Later, we are most focused on remembering our own reputations. But who we always really are, from the beginning, is a context, a parenthesis, a being who creates the world for itself by sensing. Because of the various doomsday scenarios for the fate of the Earth, we must make a sudden advance in consciousness or perish. Unless more human beings expand who they currently consider themselves be by re-including what they've excluded when they grew a personality, unless more of us grow beyond the ignorant provincialism of adolescent moralizing, the game is over. Like rats behind Pied Pup Piper, we will follow our leaders off the cliff and back into the sea forever. Roles are like clothing we've learned to put on to protect ourselves from the cold. When we take on roles, when we take off roles we have been hiding behind, the naked being we are stands there, vulnerable and defenseless. The being we are, as distinct from the roles we have been playing, doesn't need the defensive weapons we invented to scare the enemy away. Those other people out there are naked under their roles too. They're playing possum or creating a stink, or baring their fangs and growling or signaling anger, and threatening like a chimp, or running like a rabbit. The roles were developed for the sake of survival, just as our roles were. There are three levels of telling the truth, revealing the facts, honestly expressing current feelings and thoughts, and finally exposing the fiction you have devised to represent yourself and your history. When you tell the truth, you are free, simply by virtue of describing what is so. This descriptive language evokes a feeling of affirmation, a willingness to be, appreciation for being alive in the world as it is. When someone speaks the truth, everyone around them is touched and there's hardly anything to say back except, ain't that the truth? The being within which the mind resides in is the speaking and is in charge of the mind rather than getting used by the mind. Language has the power to invoke the being of human beings and rescue them from their own minds. Skill in the use of this kind of language develops through the practice of telling the truth. The clearer I am willing to be about myself, the more clearly I can see others and the more clearly I can speak to them, and you too. An honest person prefers language that reveals what is so, whether it is about someone else, the world, or himself, being fascinated when uncovering the truth from a nest of evaluation is the best game in town. When a person chooses to make the transition from habitual lying to telling the truth, the passage is scary and difficult. We have learned to assign value dishonestly and pitch our point of view with everything we say. We have been trained by scores of moralistic authorities like Nurse Ratchet. In ten cases one flew over the cuckoo's nest to keep our mouth shut and to behave as we should. Instead of speaking the truth, we have been blackmailed into a common interpretation of reality by hundreds of male and female Nurse Ratchets. Learning to describe, to speak what is simply true, requires an unleashing of hardened perceptions and a relearning of how to perceive with as little perception as possible. The only difference, learn the difference between perception and conception, and getting good through practice in distinguishing between the two can actually save your life. The most real truth is temporary and passing. Usually by the time the real truth points out through words or a finger, it is gone, it is changed. This ever-changing truth that is ever-changing is the truth of experience. The evaluation of the experience are all bullshit. Some bullshit is useful, but nearly as useful as most of us think. Evaluations are never the truth. Although a person may tell the truth about his evaluation and in fact must do so if he is to own them rather than being jailed by them, we all tend to get lost in the swamp of our evaluative minds, trying to make decisions, how to behave and what to do next, 
while constantly considering what we imagined others might imagine about us as a result of any action we anticipate taking. This concern about controlling the opinions of others and keeping control of ourselves kills more people than any form of environmental stress. Also, most of those who would die would barely know the difference, even if they did. To the extent that we all occasionally avoid experience, we all occasionally indulge in neurotic behavior. Whether we earn the label depends on the frequency, persistence, and intensity with which we deny feelings, sensations, or any experience whatsoever. A person who refuses to acknowledge experience over and over is a neurotic. This neurosis, where they consistently deny sexuality, aggression, joy, grief, love, and other feelings. Not many people sustain real change without support in creating a context called going through what has been previously avoided or kept secret. Some people do it on their own with friends who aren't therapists. No one really does it alone. Each innocent new life comes out of that eternity of blissful timelessness in the womb and begins to learn to control, distinguish, name, and manipulate the parts of the world that get distinguished. There are as many ways to be embroiled in that process and there has been human beings in history. There are these millions and millions and billions of, of, of bay, ways. And yet, we've all always shared a unitary hum, a sense of being, and a common history of having lived in the eternal bliss, in the womb. What has also always been there is the possibility to identify with that beingness rather than identifying exclusively with the unique adaptation that the being came up with to survive in the world. We human beings are homo hostilis, a hostile species, the enemy-making animal. We're driven to fabricate an enemy as an escape go to bear the burden of our denied enmity. Our greatest heroism, our willingness to surrender life itself for our loved ones, and our greatest tragedy, the mistake in useless sacrifice of our own and others' lives for meaningless causes, are central to the tragic joke we are. As difficult as it may be to, for our minds to accept, the direct expression of resentment works better than the suppression of anger to protect ourselves and each other from damage by anger. When we communicate our resentment, the person we resent, the Anger dissipates more completely in the moment of expression. The anger may get cranked up to a higher pitch that seems reasonable in many small arguments, but the intensity of the experience allows the heat out where it can cool. People can get over being mad if they face resentment one instance at a time. Even if the person towards whom we are angry doesn't change, agree to change, or even apologize, we can still forgive that person for our own benefit. So, this is what happens with anger. As children grow, constantly overpowered, cared for, and controlled, childhood expression of anger against stronger adults are punished, either overly or covertly or verse condescendingly moralized about. As children, we do the best we can to copy approved ways of dealing with anger to avoid getting punished for it. Most people, however, will not express their resentment in person to the person at whom they are angry. Instead, they gossip, they complain, they criticize, they fantasize about telling the parents off and letting it out in other indirect ways. Suppression and displacement to ideals, indignation, and judgment against others and ourselves usually work well enough that by the time we males reach 18 years of age and some elder asshole tells us to kill some people to defend some bullshit principle, we run right out and do it. Most of us don't know how to identify clearly what anger feels inside our bodies. We attend to our many racing thoughts, focusing on the rightness or wrongness of the conversation we just had, instead of turning in to our experience in the moment. We ignore our racing heart 
and then the flush of blood in our face and the tension building in our soul, shoulders and the tightness of our stomachs. When we do acknowledge these feelings, we do so only at an abstract level that subsumes too much experience. We say we are upset about some general set of behaviors on someone else's part. Even acknowledging accept is the first step. Some of us deny even that. The second step is admitting, admitting that accept, upset is anger. The third step is speaking resentment specifically in contact with one's own body and the eyes of the other person. The process of forgiveness involves the following six minimal requirements, none of which may be skipped. Number one, you have to tell the truth about what specific behavior you resent to the person face to face. You have to verbally and vocally stay unrestrained with regards to volume and propriety. You have to pay attention to the feelings and sensations in the body and to the other person as you speak. Number four, you have to express appreciation for the person that came up with the process with the same attention to your feelings and to the other person as when you are expressing resentment. You have to stay with any feelings that emerge in the process of tears or laughter, regardless of any evaluations you may have about how it makes you look. And number six, you have to stay with the discussion until you no longer feel resentful of the other person. Then, and only then, are you ready to talk about the future, make arrangements on the future, or make any agreements. The full path of growth from birth to maturity consists of number one the birth of being number two the growth of the mind number three a period of domination of the being by the mind number four liberation of the being from the mind and finally number five a mind used by the being having told the truth enough the being becomes liberated from its own mind Please do help out. It is easy. Simply like this video so more people can enjoy it. Share it too and spread the word. Subscribe to my channel. Stay up to date. And the link to this book is in the description below. So you buy it and you read and you never stop learning. Just tell the truth. Thank you. Love and respect.